take our Bibles and turn over to that passage we read just a moment ago over in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Bitter waters and sweet, Naomi in the desert, part 41. We've just read that passage and we've been looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in the wilderness wandering and we saw that the New Testament teaches that those ten failures of Israel and many other examples given in the Old Testament were written as examples for the church today. And today I'm hoping we can finish up, I had hoped to do this last week, but to finish Rebellion Test 5 and move on to Rebellion Test number 6. So the most recent thing that we've been looking at in Rebellion Test 5, which is a golden calf at Mount Horeb in Exodus chapter 32, was how the sin unto death applied to Israel and it's a sin that is still available, if you will, for the church today. The sin unto death is a serious issue because people are dying in Bible-believing churches today because they have committed the sin unto death. Now, the issue really is a matter of persistence in sin, but in the Old Testament, God killed people who persisted in sin even after they'd been warned multiple times. So here's someone persisting in sin after they've been warned over and over and over and over again, in the case of the Israelites, when they were disobeying in the wilderness. They were obviously involved in multiple sins unto death. The th second thing that we saw was how both the Old Testament and the New Testament make a connection between the sin unto death and various petitions and prayers. In other words, who should we pray for and who should we not pray for? The New Testament states that there are some sinning Christians that you must stop praying for them. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. Now listen to the next phrase. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. Now the thing that is important to us is that John clearly ties the sin unto death directly back to the golden calf which we've been studying. And he does that in the last verse in 1 John, just four verses later. I just read you those verses about the sin unto death. Four verses later, he mentions the situation with the golden calf. That means the golden calf principle is the very last thing that John warns us about before he writes the book of Revelation, which is God's judgment on the world. 1 John 5, 21, just four verses after that business that we read about, the sin unto death. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. The golden calf was the failure of Israel in the wilderness wanderings in relation to idolatry. The sin of the golden calf is clearly something that applies today. Now, two weeks ago, we began looking at Moses' response and action. Here he is, he's joyfully walking down Mount Sinai with Joshua, carrying the two tablets of the law in his hands. He's just spoken with God face to face. He's still glowing with the aura of the Shekinah glory, and we're told about how he had to put a veil over his face because uh, it was passing away. Those tablets were the ones that were written with the very finger of God. The next set that were made out, Moses chiseled. But the first set was written with the very finger of God. Wouldn't it be incredible to have those tablets somewhere in a museum today so that we could see them? <laughs> but you know something? It's interesting that God never preserves things like that for us to gawk and stare at. Remember the serpent of brass that Moses made in the wilderness? And we were talking about the test uh, of rebellion where the people were being bitten by serpents later. But remember, Moses made a serpent of brass and he set it on a pole. And everybody who looked at that brazen serpent was healed and those who didn't died. Well, later on, the people of Israel began to worship that. And we'll talk about that and how uh, later it was broken up and called Nehushtan, uh, which means a worthless thing. But... Uh, they worshipped it. That's why God doesn't let us have those artifacts because people will fall down and worship them instead of worshipping God himself. Then as Moses and Joshua were approaching the camp, they heard this really loud noise. 
Now Joshua thought it was a war going on. Joshua's a military man. Joshua thinks war. <laughs> but Moses said, no, no. It's singing. Hmm. Did you know that you can have the wrong kind of singing? And there are a lot of churches today that have the wrong kind of singing. As they twang away on their electric guitars and wiggle in under the strobe lights and, you know, have bare chests and tattoos all over their arms. and That's not worship. Oh, it's singing. The children of Israel were singing. But it certainly wasn't singing that pleased God. And there's a lot of singing today that doesn't please God. They walk into the camp, they find the Jews involved in a drunken orgy. And then Moses sees the golden calf. Moses blew a gasket. He took the tablets and he smashed them to smithereens. The tablets of the law containing the Ten Commandments. What's he do next? He takes the calf. He burns it in the fire. Now, it took some time to do this. And everybody's sort of lying around saying, whoa, what's Moses doing over there? Who let's go back to our fun. Moses is blowing a gasket in the middle of the camp. He takes it, he burns it to fire, he grinds it to powder, he throws the powder on the water, and then he makes all the Jews drink the powdered water. Then he confronts, you, you know, Aaron was his big brother. He's not confronting his little brother, he's confronting his big brother. He confronts Aaron, his big brother, with the gross immensity of the sin. And then we see Aaron making a whole bunch of very flimsy excuses, blaming the people. But you know, Moses, it's very interesting. Moses didn't wait around to conduct an investigation because he'd already seen what was going on. He didn't need any corroborating evidence. He didn't conduct an investigation. He didn't wait until everybody was sober and then give him a lecture. He didn't wait until they all got their clothes back on. Because it says Moses saw that Aaron had made them naked. Moses was a man of action. It was time to kill some people so that they would never do this again. Which, by the way, is a good argument for capital punishment. The criminal never commits another crime, and the death penalty, used quickly and appropriately, scares the willies out of everybody else. Verse 25. When Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel. Jehovah is speaking through Moses. And he's not the God of the Canaanites. He's not the God of the Philistines. He's not the God of the Amalekites. He's not the God of the Amorites. He's not the God of the Jebusites. He's the God of and Israel has sinned. And he has the right, because he is their God. He's the one who redeemed them. He's the one that brought them out of Egypt. He's the one that killed Pharaoh's army. He's the one that parted the Red Sea. He's the one that provided the man in the wilderness. Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, says this. Now when he speaks, if you're his servant, you had better obey. Put every man on his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Now, I said it last week, but I'll say it again. It should be self-evident. But it's quite obvious that God is capable of doing anything by himself without our help. If he wanted to, God could judge every sinner in the world immediately, just as soon as that sinner sins. And he could do it all by himself without our participation. But in this life, God has chosen to use people. Did you know he's chosen to use you? Except in a different capacity, he's chosen you to share the gospel. God uses people those who are his own, those who are his people, he is Yahweh, he is Jehovah, he is the Lord God of the church. And he has given a command. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
And you remember it started Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And you have a Jerusalem. Now the Levites had a choice. Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? Get over here. And the Levites came. Those were the priests. The ones who conducted the worship at the tabernacle and later in the temple. Did you know that God has made you a royal priesthood? If you're on the Lord's side, you'd better listen to him. He gave the Levites a command in relation to the sinners in the camp. He's the Lord, Yahweh, of the church. He's given you a command to witness, to tell others about Jesus. You'd better do it. Or you're in serious trouble with the Lord of the church. God uses people. Now you know it's generally recognized by biblical scholars that God established human government with a specific authority. We're getting back now to what's going on here in killing of people. God established human government with a specific authority to exercise the death penalty. And Moses is, at this point, the government. In fact, the death penalty is one of the very first things that God established when Noah and his family got off the ark. That's in Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every living thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Before this they were, uh, what are they those people that only eat green stuff? <laughs> Vegetarians. I was saying herbivores, but that's the animals. Vegetarian. But after the flood, here's the first thing God gave him the right to do. He gave him a command, be fruitful and multiply. Most Americans don't believe that, especially American Christians. They think God rescinded it. He never rescinded it. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. We're, that's explained to us in Leviticus 17.11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That's why you're not supposed to eat blood. Because that's where the life is located. And we have a big, long discussion. We could talk about that. But moving on, listen. Verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And later on he tells about if an ox gores a man and kills him, you're to kill the ox. But it's not just with animals. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man. That takes you back to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Most Bible scholars agree that's the beginning of what we call human government ordained by God. Now, in the case of the golden calf, God was quite capable of killing people because while the Levites were killing their brothers and sons, back in verse 29, and their companions and neighbors, they killed a total of, of 3,000. God, of course, killed 20,000 more, as well as killing all of the adult escapees from Egypt over 40 years in the wilderness. During that 40-year period, he killed every one of those who came out of Egypt age 20 and over. Verse 28, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. If you want the blessing of God, you must deal brutally with sin, even if in your own family. Moses was not afraid to tell the people that they had sinned. And Moses was not afraid to take immediate action against sin. Don't just talk about it. You have to do something about it. In spite of all that, 
Moses was personally willing to stand in the gap between God and the people and pray for them. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive them, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. He was willing to die for the people. That's an incredible picture of Jesus. He was not only willing, but he did. What a testimony for the band Moses. But God reiterates a very basic principle of blessing and judgment. God doesn't crush everybody, only the sinners. Verse 23, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And then after judgment, God moves forward. He, he tells him, quit thinking about the past. Start moving forward. Start obeying. Verse 34, Therefore, now go, lead the people into the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And that, then the concluding statement reminds us that God killed more people than the Levites killed. And I think there's a serious lesson for us here. Remember this. People suffer when their leaders sin. Now that's true in all the different spheres of authority that God has established. That's true in the home. That's true in the church. That's true in the workplace. That's true in government. This is true and visibly evident in the temporal and physical realm. Now I gave you a, an illustration of this last week, but I didn't give you any other illustrations. But the one I gave you last week, it's obvious in national scenarios when bad leaders go to war and the people of their country suffer. But it's also obvious when bad church leaders, for example, get involved in immorality, the people suffer. It's obvious when bad business leaders get caught embezzling money and their employees suffer and their stockholders suffer. The family damage is off the charts when one or more of the parents is a drug addict or a drunkard or a wife beater. It destroys the rest of the family. But it's also true in the spiritual sense. People always suffer when their leaders sin. Verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. And both Aaron and the people get blamed by God for making the golden calf. Aaron wanted to pass the buck and say, well, the people made me do it. In verse 35, it's because it says they made the calf which Aaron made. And the people were the ones who suffered. Now that brings us to test number six, the burning at Taborah. This is in Numbers 11, verses 1 through 3. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed them that were in the other parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. You know, I don't know if I'd have hung in there as long as Moses. I know I wouldn't have. As long as Moses did. He keeps praying for these people. They keep rebelling. He prays for them again. They rebel. He prays for them again. They rebel. I mean, all the times that God withheld his hand because of the prayer of Moses. The fire was quenched and he called the name of the place Taberah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now, I hope you noticed something important when I read those three verses. Test number six deals with a sin that the people had fallen into before. They were bellyaching, they were griping, they were complaining. So that raises a question. Now let me, let me see if you can answer this question. And I'm gonna pause for a minute after I ask the question so that you can think about it and settle on an answer for this question. You figure out the answer to this question because I'm gonna pause as soon as I ask the question. Question. How often does God have to exercise his judgment 
before we get the point? How often does he have to send judgment before we get the point? You think about that. How often does God have to exercise judgment for some sin of ours, which we repeat over and over and over again, how often does he have to exercise judgment before we get the point? I hope you got something stuck in your mind there. Okay, so now let me ask you another question. Since all suffering is not the result of sin, I hope you know that. Job didn't understand that when he was going through his trials in the book of Job. But all suffering is not the result of sin. So here's the second question. When you go through hard times, why do God's people fail to thank him for the trials of life which he is using to conform us to the image of Christ. Let me say that question again. This question number two. You'll see why I'm asking these two questions in a minute. Question, why do God's people fail to thank him for the trials of life which he is using to conform them to the image of Christ? Think about that for a moment. Okay. Now those two questions are actually what I call balancing questions. Some suffering is the result of judgment under the anger of God because of sin. Some suffering is the result of judgment under the anger of God because of sin. But on the other hand, some suffering is blessing under the love of God because he is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Some suffering, now nobody believes this, or at least we live like we don't believe it. Some suffering is blessing under the love of God because he is conforming us to the image of Christ. Most of us just jumble it all together and we never think about it. But, but the next time, or when you go through hard times, and you will, when you go through hard times, pause and do an analysis. Analyze why you are suffering. If you fail to do that, you're going to end up with a guilty conscience for things you shouldn't have a guilty conscience for, and you're going to sear your conscience on things where you should come under conviction. Why are you suffering? If you fail to do this, you will not know how to properly respond to what God is doing in your life. If you fail to make that analysis, you will not respond, not just for head knowledge, but you will not respond properly to what God is doing in your life. Let me explain. Judgment requires repentance. That's what we see going on in these wilderness tests. Judgment requires repentance. But love doesn't require repentance. Love requires thankful submission. That's the appropriate response when you are coming under the tests of God to conform you to the image of Christ where he is molding and shaping and developing your character. He's not telling you have to repent. He's saying, child, submit to me. Follow my direction. I know the best path for your life. I'm leading you. I'm protecting you. 
I'm providing for you. I'm keeping you from things that you want, but that you really shouldn't have. And I'm doing it because I love you. Suffering in both cases, and in some cases it may even be the same type of suffering. But the question is, have you analyzed why it's coming? Judgment requires repentance, but love requires thankful submission. Failure to repent, of course, is sin, and it may lead to the sin unto death. That's the key issue with sin unto death. You refuse to repent, and you keep on doing it, and you're warned again, and you keep on doing it, and you're warned again, and you keep on doing it, and you're warned again, you keep on doing it, and God says finally, I am sick and tired of this, y'all coming home. Time to turn out the lights. Time to jerk the actor off the stage. The consistent, insistent, willful, stubborn rebellion, even if you've been warned multiple times. And when that happens, the church isn't even to pray for the individual who's involved in that stubborn, willful, rebellious sin. Instead, you turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul states that very clearly in 1 Corinthians. But, on the other hand, what about the suffering that comes as a blessing of God's love because he's conforming us to the image of Christ? If we fail to thankfully submit to what I call the pain of pruning, if we fail to thankfully submit to the pain of pruning, that is also sin. And I think it's at that point that most Christians most of the time fail. Jesus himself told us that God prunes the branches on the vine for a specific purpose, so that we will bear fruit. Failure to thank God for the pruning stops our ability to bear fruit because failure to thank him usually results in complaining about it. And that stops fruit bearing. Complaining always stops fruit bearing. Did you know that? When you complain about what you're going through, instead of realizing this, this is an act of God's love as he is pruning deadwood off, this is an act of God's love because he's conforming me to the image of Christ. And I say, thank you, Father, I submit to your will. You know, that's hard to do. When he takes something out of our life we desperately wanted, learning to say thank you. By the grace of God, I've been trying to learn that for the last four years ever since he took Judy home. And I have to keep going back and saying, thank you, Father. You did this for a purpose. Because you're conforming me to the image of Christ. It's a suffering you've designed to make me focus on eternity. With you, it's different things, I know. That's only one area that God's worked in my life. We could spend the rest of the day talking about what God has done to work in my life. But you know where he's worked in your life. How have you responded? If it was sin, stubborn, rebellious sin, that demands repentance. But if it is the blessing under the love of God because he's conforming you to the image of Christ, there must be thankful submission to what he has done. Failure to thank God for the pruning stops our ability to bear fruit as well, because failure to thank him usually results in complaining, which is the serious sin of Israel in the wilderness. Do you remember what Jesus said about pruning and the results that God wants to accomplish by pruning? John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that is, he prunes it, he trims it, he clips it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So we see bearing fruit, not bearing fruit, bearing more fruit. Then verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ah, the word has something to do with this. Abide in me, and I in you. That is the key to the entire passage. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. You cannot bear fruit if you are not abiding in Christ. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, I hope you're catching the word abide, abideth, abiding. That's the topic of the passage. And I am him, which he does if you've trusted him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. So we have fruit, no fruit, more fruit, and now much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, Listen to this. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Five things happen if you fail to abide in Christ. Five things will happen to you if you fail to abide in Christ. He listed them for you. Cast forth as a branch, withered. Men gather them, cast them into the fire. They are burned. And now we have the verse that's the prayer promise that everybody loves, verse 7. Fruit bearing and answered prayer, listen, Fruit bearing and answered prayer both hinge on abiding in Christ. Verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Ah, that goes back to where he was talking about his words. My words abide in you. That means you're going to have soaked up what Jesus says. Ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. But there are two contingencies. Number one, if you abide in me. Number two, if my words abide in you, then you can ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. I hope you get the idea here that you cannot glorify God unless you are not just having a few you know, withered cherries at the end of the branch, unless you're abounding with spiritual fruit. You cannot be a disciple of Christ unless you are abounding with spiritual fruit. You say, where's that? I'll show you in a minute. To many fruitless Christians, they think that they're glorifying God, and too many fruitless Christians think that they're disciples of Christ just because they trusted Jesus. Did you know that's not true? You are not a disciple of Christ unless you're bearing much fruit. You say, show it to me. Okay, listen to what Jesus said. Very next verse. You don't glorify God unless you're bearing much fruit. And you're not a disciple of Christ unless you're bearing much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You think, well, I got a satisfactory amount. I got two or three bananas out there on the end of the limb. Or I got two or three pickles out there. <laughs> I know, pickles don't grow on trees. You get the idea. Let me repeat what I just said. Let it sink in. Please, please let it sink in. You cannot glorify God unless you are abounding with spiritual fruit because the fruit is what everyone else sees and that's what brings glory to God. And I told you what the fruit is. It's Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Jesus said it here. It's not me saying it. It's Jesus said it. That you cannot glorify God unless you're buying, uh, bearing much fruit. It's not just bearing fruit. That was our first step. It's definitely not, not bearing fruit. 
is not just bearing more fruit. We get to the stage where it's bearing much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified. In this way, my Father is glorified. It's by these means my Father is glorified that we bear much fruit. Are you bearing it? Please let it sink in. Not only that, you cannot be a disciple of Christ unless you are abounding with spiritual fruit. He says, when you're bearing the much fruit, so, as a result of all of that, ye shall be my disciples. You are not a disciple of Christ just because you trusted Jesus for salvation. You are not a disciple of Christ unless you are bearing much fruit. I didn't say you're not saved. I said you're not a disciple of Christ unless you are bearing much fruit. Only people who bear much fruit are disciples of Jesus. The rest are merely followers, like the crowds who showed up for the free lunches, or the crowds who showed up at Dr. Jesus' office to get healed, or the crowds who showed up to watch the miracle shows. But if you're not bearing much fruit, you're not his disciple. Bearing much fruit is indispensable. And so, oh my, I can't believe our time is up. Well, the question I want to answer next week is all right. What did Jesus say about the mechanics of bearing fruit? How do we do it? How can we bear much fruit? You have to wait till next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, teach us how we can bear much fruit, for that is what brings you glory. Teach us how we can bear much fruit, for that is the proof that we're not merely a follower, but we are a disciple. Take your word and apply it to each of our hearts, Father, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.